and welcome to this year active thought leadership interview on Europe's chips future. We're looking at the strategic investment and real world impact. You'll hear about why semiconductors matter for Europe's sovereignty and competitiveness, how strategic investments are shaping the landscape, tangible results about what's already been achieved and looking ahead to what's next. Joining me to talk about all of that is Patrick Pipe, Director of Strategic Partnerships at NXP and Romano Hoffman, Strategic Development Director at IMEC. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Let's start with why chips are so crucial for Europe's future. Romano, perhaps you could start. Yeah, well, chips can be really found everywhere. Huh? So whether it is in, the, in your pocket, in your cell phone, or whether it's in your car, but more importantly, the supply chain is global. And during the pandemic, we learned that the supply chain can be really disrupted. And then Europe really has a, a big issue here. The big issue is actually that we don't have enough fabrication and design capacity in Europe. And that's why the European Commission launched the, the EU CHIP Act uh, just during the pandemic, because they saw, and especially the, the automotive sector suffered from that, that they couldn't get uh, the chips quickly, quick enough. So what they did with the CHIP Act is really to relaunch, I would say, the semiconductor industry, and especially on fabrication and design. And they tried to build this up from the R&D sector, because Europe is quite strong in R&D. So when we look to the big RTOs, so the research technology organizations, IMEC, Fraunhofer, CEA, but also Tyndall and VTT, they are all world leading. And that's what the European Commission tries to do with Pillar 1 of the CHIP Act, to really build it from that um, yeah, seed that we have already and to grow the entire industry from there. Patrick, your perspective on the same thing. Yeah, I think I fully agree with what uh, Romano is stating. And I think for me, the three words are strategic, big and clean. Uh, it's strategic to have European chips in the worldwide products over the globe. Uh, and that it's important to do the necessary investments in Europe because we want to have an equal level playing field in our negotiations with partners in other continents. Second, uh, it's big. If you look, for example, Romano talked about the automotive industry. Uh, in Europe, uh, the top three uh, in the automotive semiconductor industry are European players. It's NXP, ST and Infineon. Uh, and we should make sure that we keep the strength within Europe and that we keep this market share and these positions within Europe. And the last point, it's clean. I think if you talk about the climate, uh, chips allow to reduce power in all types of applications and power reductions mean more clean energy. And uh, I think therefore it's very important that we keep going for the semiconductor industry to play an important role in Europe. Well, let's stay with the um, CHIPS joint undertaking. How does that and the important project of common European interest to give it its full title, how do they complement each other? Well, they are fully complementary. Uh, if I look to the CHIPS EU programme, there we participate often with large consortia consisting of industry, uh, large enterprises, small and medium sized enterprises, RTOs and universities to work on a common team and to look over different types of applications. Where can we find some commonalities? Where can we do some common developments? If we look to IPK, uh, this program is much bigger in nature. The investments are much bigger. Uh, it's also an important CAPEX uh, pillar in the IPK program. And uh, the biggest is that it is also containing possible to have higher risks in the program and to do first industrial deployment. And that's the big uh, differentiator that within IPK you can go to first industrial prototype production, uh, while the chip GU is uh, covering mostly uh, RDNI in the lower tier levels, which is of course also very important and therefore they complement each other. What is often started in a chip GU proposal is often then opened towards IPK and commercialized via the IPK channel. Well, you focused on IPK. Romano, I'm going to ask you about the, the, the joint undertaking. Can you share any concrete results that show its real added value for the semiconductor industry or the industry landscape in Europe? Yeah, well, Chips EU has been proven already for many years how well good they are, and it was already emphasized by, by Patrick, uh, the, the importance of that. So I would not even say only Chips EU, but also their predecessors. Uh, so you have, uh, when we started actually, uh, ENIAC and Artemis, uh, they were um, next to each other. Then they got merged into Excel, and then was a very, very short time KDT. And I would like to give an example here to, to stress the importance of the, the, the Chips EU projects, the ASML projects, or the, the projects of ASML under the coordination of um, so what they do is actually enable 
product development, even though it is in a very early stage, as Patrick noted, uh, it's typically lower TRL, but it really facilitates not only that ASML can do the development of the new scanners, uh, whether it is an, um, yeah, an EUV or even an, a next uh, version that might come after EUV, I don't know, I mean, I'm not an expert, but it really enables, I would say, the collaboration also with other actors. So it's not ASML on its own who is doing it. It's together with industry players, together with smaller and medium enterprises. So they also get in contact with ASML and yeah, then, then can do business later on together. So I think that's maybe the most important thing of the ChipDU uh, projects, that they serve as a catalyst for future business. Well, I want to explore this a bit further. So what is the added value on top of the, 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 the things you've already listed? What does it bring on top of national programs, IPK or private investment? I can start with it. I think the added value is really the cooperation and the possibility to work in a full ecosystem. Uh, I think first of all, uh, industry can work together with universities and research institutes on a European scale. And I think IMIC is an example of uh, a European scale laboratory. So they can work together with multiple companies in multiple countries. From an XP perspective, we are also working with other universities and RTOs throughout Europe. Uh, secondly, it also allows us to work together on common technologies and I would like to give two examples. Uh, for example, uh, RISC-V, which is a new type of processor, uh, replacing partly the ARM technology, which is the market leader in that domain. Uh, there we have to join forces with the industry together to really develop a European roadmap, which we did, and then to implement this roadmap. And this is possible via the CHIPS Geo program. And this is very important that, for example, this has led to the creation of Quintauris, which is a new company with investments, private investments and uh, uh, government incentives uh, like NXP, ST, Infineon, Bosch, uh, Nordic and Qualcomm have invested in the company and this will be one of the key European players in Risk V. and this was possible thanks to initial projects within the CHIP Geo program. The second one is, for example, cooperation with small and medium-sized enterprises. ChipZoo allows that we work together, get to know these companies, check their technology, experiment with the technology, and this often leads to long-term uh, cooperations uh, and sometimes also even to acquisitions. Like recently, NXP acquired TT Tech Auto uh, in the area of software-defined vehicles, which is an important growth area. And this was possible thanks to already a long year tra uh, tradition of cooperation in the Chips U program. I mean, Romano, is there enough EU level coordination to, if you like, really leverage this multiplying effect? I'm thinking of examples like the EU chips design platform. Yeah, well, as Patrick said, I think indeed the, the big benefit of these international programs like uh, the Chips EU is that you can collaborate at European level. You cannot do it at national level, that is really too limited. You really need to involve all players. And even, I would say, you should try to go beyond that. It becomes now a bit difficult with all the geopolitical tensions. But that's also one reason why we started with the EU chip design platform. So we want to make Europe strong again in chip design. We want to facilitate and, um, I would say, stimulate entrepreneurship uh, for companies that want to develop their own IC. So we are bringing all the actors together to really make those startups and SMEs, yeah, to bring them as fast as possible uh, to the market. Um, and, and this you can only do when you operate at a European level and not at the national level. But of course, Europe is completing on a global level as well, Patrick. Um, how important is things like you know, the, 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 the true working together as an EU functioning? Well, first of all, it's important to work together as a EU, and to me that is to make sure that in Europe we have a strong negotiation position towards other continents. Of course, we have also to work together with uh, other continents. If you are a market leader in a certain domain, you have to sell worldwide. Uh, you have to be a global company. So I think it's uh, a balance that you need to have between what do we do in Europe, uh, where do we want to be very strong in Europe, and what do we do on a worldwide scale. And how does that dovetail or work with the concept of strategic sovereignty? Well, I would say it has become very important now with all the geopolitical tensions. Huh? So we really need to be sovereign, at least for the, the critical infrastructure. So in critical infrastructure, you have also chips. And of course, you need to make sure that they are unhackable. 
And if they are produced in a fab outside of Europe, then you cannot guarantee that there is a foreign entity who interferes eh, with, the, with the chip. So that's one reason I would say why we want to have sovereignty on European soil. And that's also what we try to do at, uh, I will come back to the EU chip design platform. That's also what we try to enable there. So we want to give preferential access uh, to European uh, foundries that we have already uh, here. We also want to attract uh, foundries or companies from outside to put facilities in Europe, uh, so like uh, TSMC is now doing in Dresden, ESMC, so that's what we are really trying to build up. Because as I said earlier, yeah, we are not so strong on the fabrication side. Um, we are a bit stronger on the design side, but we really need to grow it together to, uh, to make that sovereignty work. Um, before we look ahead, I'd like to just briefly touch on benefits to SMEs of involvement. Which of you would like to take that or elaborate a little on that? Well, I think it's very important to work together with SMEs. I think as large industries, we are always looking at potential SMEs to cooperate with. Uh, as stated, sometimes it does not work directly on a bilateral base and the chips you allows to work together. And this is beneficial for the SMEs who can find some potential new partners or potential new customers at the end. And it's also beneficial for the large industry because these SMEs often work on specific technologies where we are not working upon or where we are looking for the next generation and then uh, can keep working together with these uh, companies. And as stated, uh, if the cooperation is very successful, it can even lead to an acquisition at the end. So let's look to the future then, Romano. What's next for Europe's chips ecosystem? Well, we just started. Huh? So the, like I said earlier, and the, the EU Chips Act has been launched um, just during the pandemic. And now we need to keep on investing uh, in what we started in that time. So what we are building now are the pilot lines, uh, like at iMac Nano IC and in uh, CEA we have FAMES, but also with the EU Chip Design Platform, the competence centers, the, the chip fund, we cannot stop now. We need to continue, I would say, also in the new work programs with investments on these programs. Because if you say, well, now you need to walk on your own feet, that, that doesn't work. So the, the, the money needs to keep on flowing. Of course, you can be critical to the results that we do. And I think the key word here is industrialization. So we need to make sure that what we do at the research and development area is ready to be industrialized. And that's what we will do in the next phase also for the pilot lines. And for sure, as I said already, for the design platform, that is something that we are looking into. So we want to stimulate also at the university level that more startups are generated. And this we do together with Europractice. It's a very old initiative that is focused on the design, I would say, stimulation at universities and research centers so that they bring the flow of new startups into the design platform and that we grow again the industry in Europe. And Patrick, what's your vision of the future? Well, uh, I think it's correct that uh, ecosystems are playing more and more an important role. I think the traditional value chain has disappeared. If I look to the past, uh, semiconductor companies, they sell their chips towards the tier one. They build it on a board. The tier one builds it to the OEM, to the, for example, the automotive manufacturer. They were writing some software on top of it. And then they had a car, which was mainly mechanical. If you look now, a car, it's the new trend is what is called the software defined vehicle. The competition is not anymore in what's the strongest engine, but what is the strongest connection? What is the strongest infotainment in the car? How is it connected uh, to the outside world? And therefore you have to work together from the start in the total ecosystem with car manufacturers, tier one, semicon companies, software companies, RTOs to make sure that you're on the next generation. And there we are only in a starting point. And I think this is what we should intensify and, uh, in Europe to make sure that all partners have an equal weight in the ecosystem and bring together value in that ecosystem and make sure that in Europe we stay competitive to, towards the Chinese and the American uh, automotive manufacturers, for example. Finally, why should our audience, why should stakeholders come to FX 2025, the uh, European Forum for Electronic Components and Systems? I know it's taking place in Malta at the beginning of December. Well, first of all, they should come because it's in Malta. Yeah? Malta <laughs> is a nice place to be in the beginning of December. But of course, that's not the only reason they should come to Malta, to FX. FX is really the place where all the stakeholders are meeting. Uh, so not only the project partners who are involved in all the Chips EU projects, but also the, the policy makers, um, other industry actors, um, also universities. I mean, everyone will be there. 
So if you really want to interact and be part of the ecosystem and make a change uh, for Europe, then this is the place to be, I would say. Patrick, your pitch and why people should come. <laughs> well, I think fully agree with what Romano has stated, but I would even say Mal uh, the FX in Malta is not for me an event or a symposium. I call it often the biggest think tank in Europe because you have that many people from all over the place, from universities, from industry, from governments that can think together, that have new ideas, that network together. And I think that's the biggest advantage for me. And of course, the last reason is also, we know each other very well from many virtual meetings and technological discussion, but to have a beer together and think about new ideas and the future of tomorrow, that's even more worthwhile than all the technological discussion that take place. Face to face, that's where a lot of the future is built. Exactly. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you to the whole team at Euractive and to you for watching. Remember, you can find out more about other Euractive events online. And of course, you can find out about that FX event by searching online as well. We hope you will join us for another thought leadership interview soon.